Welcome everyone to Visiting the Cosmos. My name is Gabriel Alvarado Marin. I am a web designer and illustrator at the SETI Institute. Uh, and with us, we have a panel of three very interesting speakers and I'd like to uh, thank them for coming by and, and sharing their expertise with us. Um, to my left, we have Lynette Cook. She is an artist who is well known for her scientific illustrations and more specifically her depictions of planets discovered outside of our solar system. Her work has been featured on numerous books, periodicals, and documentaries for Time, PBS, Learning Channel, Sky and Telescope, Astronomy Magazine, and, and many, many others. Uh, more recently, she has been working as a consultant for NASA's Aspire program, uh, and she is also an illustrator for the Gemini Observatories in Chile and Hawaii. Next to her is uh, Rosalie Lopez. She's a senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and an expert on volcanoes on Earth and, uh, and uh, other planets, and she has worked on the NASA missions Galileo and Cassini. She has visited more than 50 active volcanoes all over the world and written more than 100 peer-reviewed publications. In addition to her numerous awards for her work in science and public outreach, in 2005 she was awarded the Carl Sagan Medal by the Division for Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society in recognition of her success in communicating science to the general public. And at the far end, we have Charles Lindsay. He is a multimedia artist who photographs the interface between nature and culture. It is his fascination with our relationship to the earth which connects all of his work, living with a rainforest tribe, traveling with turtle hunters, looking at his own experience of fly fishing or the culture of golf and his relationship to the natural world. His camera-less photographs and videos are a visual exploration of nature in an abstract sense, influenced by space, and scientific imagery. And I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here again. And uh, Lynette, uh, let's start with you. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about the, the process of your illustrations and uh, why providing illustrations for uh, space in the public is important. Well, I think it's very clear that some people respond well to the written word and can read an article full of scientific terminology and instantly know what is going on. But that certainly isn't for everybody. And many people are much more able to look at an image and get a sense of what that, that written word is about and emotionally feel it compelling. And that's where I come in because the scientists are doing their research and they're working with graphs and charts and numbers and it is sometimes hard for them to relate to the public and to children in, in the schools really what that means. So I am able to work with the editors, scientists, art directors and come up with visuals that are then used educationally to help disseminate the science to others. So my work is really geared toward depicting what is out there, but within that, there is quite a range. And if I may have the first image up, this is called Kepler's Worlds. This is a piece that I did for Astronomy Magazine. And this is um, an example of really why, why artists have a good role here. It is well documented historically that space artists really helped get the space program going in terms of public interest. And in a way, I am continuing with that with this image. This was commissioned a couple of years ago, and it was for an article talking about what kinds of worlds Kepler was likely to find. Now, of course, fast forward to today, and we have many, many hundreds of, of planet candidates that we feel really are, are planets. Uh, but when I created this, it was really unclear how many there were going to be and when they would be discovered. But the broad range is from Earth-like worlds up to Jupiter-like worlds, and I am showing all of that in this image, in this montage. And depicted in the lower left-hand corner is an Earth-like world, and of course that is the Holy Grail. That is what all of us really want to find eventually, something that is like our own world. Okay, next image, please. 
And this is a piece I did for Jeff Marcy. It is one of his planets, one of his discoveries. Another role of the astronomical artist is to show what might be there now, but that we can't see yet. The data show the star and the planet, the planet being the ringed world here, but we don't know if there are any moons. I am able to show what could be there that our data is not yet able to determine. And I really do have to talk with, in this case, Jeff, to find out where the art might be used and if it is appropriate to include this. There will be times, such as for a press release, that the scientist is very keen on having only what is in the science data, meaning the star and the planet only. But in this case, I was able to put in a moon. With this planet, it is believed that the planet is in, in the habitable zone during part of its orbit. If there is water on the moon, then it could be liquid at some point in time. And Jeff really thinks it's pretty cool to show my art in his talks and say, oh, well, the artist threw that in there because she wanted to. <laughs> but it's not in the data, but then he goes on to say, but it could be there. It really could be there. We look at the planets of our solar system. We know that most of them have moons, and therefore we can theorize that many of these exoplanets have moons as well. All right, next piece, please. This is the LISA. I did this for, for Nature, and it was an article for the LISA project, which is actually three craft that form a equal, equilateral triangle. And this is an example of how it is sometimes hard to figure out what the very best image is. It usually, is, if, if you're in a group, you know, you're working collaboratively with the researcher and the editor and the art director, and everybody has their own idea of what is important. And in this case, it was really hard to pin down what is the best. So I did three versions and submitted all three. And you can see that on the very left-hand side, we have the grid, and we have the ripples, the colliding galaxies. In the middle version, we also show the spacecraft, LISA, in the lower right-hand corner. And in the third image, you do not have the grid. Now, LISA was expected to show um, gravitational waves, to, to uh, study gravitational waves. And the grid is often used in space art to indicate space-time and ripples in space-time. But there was some thought amongst the group I was working with that this might be confusing to the reader. Like, what's that grid doing there? Because the grid really doesn't exist in space. You can't physically see it. So maybe we don't want it in there. Or maybe we really don't want the Lisa craft in there. So I submitted all three, and then I could figure out what to do. Okay, next. And here, uh, as a space artist, I get to do fun things sometimes. This was for my book, Infinite Worlds, in which I could conjecture what other life forms might be like. This is a light being, an intelligent light being. It is made of light rather than carbon. Who knows what that could be like, but it is something that's discussed in science fiction sometimes, and maybe it's really out there. So this is my rendition of what that might be like. And last, we should have one more. I did this for Davis Sobel's book, The Planets. This is a type of image I rarely get to do because you can see it is more playful. It is not trying to be a realistic view of the universe. But I was able to take elements of astronomy and put it together in something really fun. In her book, she's talking about legends, and she's talking about real data and folklore, and just bringing a lot of different kinds of information together, and I was able to express that. In fact, if you look at the left, my little topiary bushes are actually trying to show the progression of the the gas and dusk nebula on the left, if you look at the bottom left, and then they are gradually forming into planets toward the top. So it was a very creative and fun thing to do. 
But since my work is often used in science magazines and press releases, this is out of the ordinary for me, but um, it, I think will show you the broad range of art that is possible in visioning the cosmos and what that, that is all about. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, Rosalie, you have collaborated with uh, Michael Carroll on a book called Alien Volcanoes, and you're collaborating with him on another book, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, as a scientist, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the work, or working with an artist and the uh, interplay that goes on between somebody trained in the hard sciences and, and an artist? Okay, sure. Um, I'm one of these um, scientists Lynette referred to who works with uh, data and uh, numbers and charts. And, uh, but every scientist at some stage uh, in fact, at many stages of their career, needs to work with artists and illustrators um, because it is really very important to convey to the public and even to other scientists uh, what your ideas are. And uh, um, artists uh, really have a very important role in that. Uh, you know, for example, uh, our press releases, uh, we uh, work with uh, illustrators uh, to... Um, Makeup to help people visualize uh, often, you know what uh, what's going on uh, in the science, and uh, even uh, when we write a, uh, a proposal, for example, for a new mission to NASA, the cover is extremely important. So we are actually working with uh, uh, the the artists and the, uh, spending quite a lot of time on what that cover should be like. Um, so actually, th there is a lot of interaction. But my um, collaboration with Michael Carroll started when I was working on the Galileo mission and working on the volcanoes of Io. And I got this phone call from Michael Carroll, who I had never met before. And he said, um, I am writing an article for a magazine about Io. And um, they commissioned me to do a painting of uh, one of the volcanoes on Io. So, which one do you think I should do? Uh, and uh, I actually did have my favorite, a volcano called Tupan. And uh, uh, so uh, I, you know, I sent him the uh, images that we had, and we started talking on the phone. And he would ask me questions like, um, but what would it look like if you were there? And I thought, well, this is weird, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not there, you know, I'm a scientist. I look at data and we take spacecraft data from above. But that became very interesting and actually very uh, challenging at times. And I even involved some of my other colleagues and, uh, uh, and he ended up doing a painting from the inside of the caldera. And, uh, uh, and we were arguing about the colors and uh, what the sky would look like and uh, uh, and there were uh, jets venting and what angle they should be. Uh, so then the science uh, came into the art to actually constrain the art. Well, anyway, after uh, some interaction with Michael Carroll, uh, we uh, uh, ended up writing a book together. And the idea of the book was that, uh, you know, he would do the illustrations and uh, some of the writing. And we wrote a book called Alien Volcanoes. And a copy is in the uh, silent auction. Uh, so you can see some of these paintings there. And uh, I also ended up buying his uh, painting of Tupin, the first one we collaborated on. Because, uh, you know, I felt I had put so much work into it. <laughs> and I really wanted to have it. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, we are now collaborating on a second book. We also did, uh, uh, you know, an article, uh, well, in fact, a couple of articles together. And, and it's been really fun. And, uh, and it's actually been a collaboration almost exclusively on the Internet and the telephone. And that, that's also something interesting that uh, uh, we actually started writing this book before we had ever met each other. Uh, and uh, we're even cooking up an idea for another book. Uh, so it's, it's been a, a really fun collaboration. And, uh, and at times I have involved some of my colleagues into it as well. And uh, for example, one of his paintings about Enceladus with a, a jet. And then people in the whole Cassini uh, mailing list started arguing about uh, uh, you know, what 
angle should this plume uh, really be, and uh, uh, and it's it's been very fun. Our second book it's called uh, Alien Seas, and that's going to be about seas of uh, not only of uh, uh, liquid methane in the case of Titan, but uh, seas of water under icy crusts of uh, uh, outer planet moons, but seas of sand, seas of lava, uh, the quote seas that we find in a lot of planets. And uh, we are actually editing it and colleagues are writing individual chapters and we are working with these colleagues um, to illustrate this chapter. So um, it's uh, been a lot of fun. Thanks, Rosalie. Charles, your uh, work takes uh, more of an experimental uh, spin. And you've invented a cameraless photographic process. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that and, and a little bit more about your work in general. Sure. So the. Um you know, it's interesting listening to other artists talk about what, what and why they do. Um, I'm, I, I went to school for geology. I was interested in sciences, and, and I thought what uh, profession would take me to the ends of the earth. So I started out with that, went into photography. You know, I listened to that bio that gets read, and it kind of sounds like a different person because it's all these chapters that are sort of gone in the, in the stratigraphy of life. But... Ultimately, as an artist, I, I'm using my, the tools to explore and to learn. And then I really am ex trying to express the ineffable that is expressing things that there's no better way to express them. So it's the right tool for the right job. I'm also a lover of abstraction. And so uh, the process, the, the, the visual process of what I'm doing, I'm really doing multimedia now, started. It's, it's a mixture of cameraless photography and drawing, a carbon-based material. I work on a clear base. And so what I got from, more importantly, rather than sort of the geekdom of the process, um, I got these images that were very stimulating. And, and, and stimulation's a, a big point because I, I mean, I'm a nature lover, but I, I love visceral experiences. I really like to get smacked by experiences. And so part of the way one does that is with um, exploration out in the field and, and testing ourselves against the environment and some of that classic stuff and then trying to express it. So I'm, I'm, I'm this lover of science. I'm also interested in pattern recognition. One of the things that happened in these negatives that I developed that reminded me a lot of what I studied in geology was that the, the patterns were very complex, truly organic, highly resolved, native resolution of the material itself and then I'm scanning it. But more importantly, one of the things that I, that I experienced in that work, and I say this in a kind of, you know, it's, it's, I'm basically harnessing nature in making the negatives. I mean, I'll go beyond that in a sec. But what I found was these images that I could look at for a long time. I mean, that was a real turn on. I have some friends that were painters, and they would come over when I, you know, printed them as large photographs. And, you know, people commented on how compelling they were to look at. And I'm not taking credit, it's not like I made a stick man, and there it is, but there, there was something in the material itself. And so then I started taking that, that material imagery and working with it, animating it in video, all kinds of stills, uh, working with color, analog domain, domain putting dyes into these works. Um, so I was getting images that satisfied me, and ultimately that was the first point. I mean, this is, Part of the beauty of being an, an artist is it's non-empirical. There's a huge freedom to that. And, and, and my, my first, I think, job, my, the first order, is to turn myself on by the work. And then it comes to a point where we share it. OK, so I'm making these images. And the progression was literally, at some point, I was not satisfied with pictures in frames in a, on a wall in a gallery where people whispered. I started animating, and then I started to develop sound to bring in. So basically, I began creating environments. So you start thinking what it, and, and I think also it, it, it commonly happens that artists will start to pursue things without knowing exactly the whys and whats that they're doing. These things tend to be revealed later on. Whereas a scientist, more often not, we can, you know, my colleagues here can say whether this is right or not. You know, you're, you're, you're looking for an answer to this question. The question's very clear. As an artist, it's, it's often not. And that's part of the beauty of it is that the answer gets revealed later, or even the question gets revealed later. So I started working with these things, making environments. The environments I'm making are very otherworldly, which is probably part of the reason that I'm here and affiliate with, this, with the Institute. 
I also, I'm just a huge fan of everything that goes on at the Institute. And the scientists there have been very welcoming. And there's a lot of hybrid science being done. And I find that fascinating. Um, so the other thing, the next stage, and I have a couple of my collaborators in the audience that are you know, making funny faces at me right now, but um, is that the work, um, the interest in my work, one, it allowed this, me to get this position as artist in residence at the Institute, but I've, I began um, collaborating on a, on a much higher level than I have previously, I often really worked uh, alone. And um, so one of my main collaborators, Eric Hansen, is out in the audience, and he's helping me to do very sophisticated animations with these source images that are scanned at high resolution. So the whole thing has developed, I would say, over the, about the course of a decade into creating these environments. Also, the, um, the technology that's available is getting cheaper and, and more intuitive and easier to use, also better accepted by the audience and by museums and so forth. So this whole area where what I'm going to just close with is and what I've really sort of zoned in on is the territory that I'm interested in is really this mixture of truly organic information and technology. And that, that starts to get to this territory of the, the singularity where our processing will be such that we can reverse engineer everything, including the brain and biology, and then move into our next evolutionary stage. So I'm interested in the science. I'm very much a, a fan of lay science, but it, it's that because I know I'm I'm literally hanging out with rocket scientists and real brains, and clearly I'm not that. So there's some sort of uh, translation, and, and I'm a sponge for that information. You know, what is being expressed? I mean, that at some point you just put it out there as an artist, and then, you know, there's feedback from the audience, whether you want to take that feedback or not becomes something else. But so that, this is the territory that I'm exploring, and I think, you know, it, it is these big questions that you get, you know, the, it, it is the questions that the SETI Institute and so many people here, and I'm sure many of you are interested in is, you know, how did life begin? What does it look or sound like elsewhere? You know, what is it about? So I, I think, you know, it comes down to those things. What's sort of funny sitting here is, is that, you know, they were the questions that fascinated me as a kid when I was seven, eight, nine, and when I was 13, 14. It's, I'm dealing with them as, a, as an adult and, and um, a little more maturity, perhaps, but but it is that. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm at, and and so that's that's where the work comes from. Thanks, Charles. Uh, before I open up the floor to uh, questions from the audience, uh, I'd like to uh, give you a chance to respond to any of the comments made, uh, add to the conversation. Otherwise, uh, I'll open up the uh, the floor. But before I do that, also I'd like to announce that there there's been a typo in the program, and I. I've been told I should mention this. Uh, the auction uh, does not close on Sunday. If anybody was planning on coming to that, actually closes today. So get your bids in after this. Uh, and that's it. And uh, yeah, if we can, uh, anybody, anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone around. That sounds better. Uh, for LightNet, I, I imagine, uh, about how much of your art is actually space-related? Is this all you do? And for some reason, I'm just interested in the art business. I have a technical degree, but I took smart classes because I did a lot of computer graphics. And so I know a lot of struggling artists. How much of uh, the work you do is commissioned versus how much do you just do on your own and try to sell? That is always fluctuating. I got my start as artist photographer for the Morrison Planetarium in San Francisco, and I was the artist there for 16 years. And I had a side business as a freelancer, because that was three quarters time. So at that point in time, I could say almost 100% was space art of one type or another. And today, it's, I don't know, maybe 50-50, because um, with the space art and fine art, I'm getting back into fine art as well, because space art has really changed from being traditionally created to being almost all digital now. I work with publishers and, and organizations that really want a quick turnaround on the, on the art, and they want to be able for me to make changes. Uh, very quickly. So it is all computer-based at this point. 
so a, a job, a commission will come in. I recently did something for the Gemini Observatory, and then I drop everything else I'm doing and work on it until it's done. And then I suddenly have an exhibit of fine art that I have to get ready for, so I whip out the paintbrushes and the, uh, the golden paints, and I do that. And then here's a commission on space art again. So, so I'm, I'm going back and forth on that, and I sometimes teach as well. So I am an artist of one flavor or another uh, nearly 100% of the time, but I just switch around with what I am doing depending on what's happening at the moment. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Uh, this question is for Lynette. Uh, where do you go for um, just sources and inspiration for when you're working on extrasolar planets and stuff like that? I try to work with the discovers if possible. If it's a piece of art that I'm generating myself, and I have done a lot of that, and I try to, I've worked with Jeff Marcy a lot, I've worked with some of the other researchers, and I will ask them for their input on what they'd like to see in artwork, and we discuss, for example, the type of the star, the temperature, the distance between the, the planet and the star, whether it could be liquid water, et cetera, and then do something based on that. If it's for a magazine, say if it's for astronomy, then I'm usually talking with the art director, I'm talking with the editor there at astronomy, and there might also be input from the writer of the article who is a third party. So it can be a team, and that's pretty fun. It can get confusing when everybody has input and maybe a different idea, but we all do somehow come together and narrow it down in the end. Um, also, I go on the internet sometimes to look at what other people have done, if other art has been done on the subject or similar subjects. And I also look at photographs in the, in the old days, I mean, it's not so, so old, but when the first exoplanets were being discovered, all of these Jupiter mass and several Jupiter mass planets, well, I looked at, at the Voyager shots because it, the art needed to be like Jupiter, but not exactly Jupiter, because the viewer had to know it was something other than Jupiter. But I looked at those cloud bands a lot, and the red spot, and all the little swirly things. So there are lots of places that I go to for information and source material. Now, I know there are more questions. Don't be shy. Once they're gone, they're gone. The space art, art market is composed of several elements, uh, uh, institutional things like for the planetariums, there's the, the NASA laboratories and the uh, observa other observatories, and then there's the commercial market like the astronomy magazines and the science fiction magazines. How does the market fragment, and not fragment, but wh how, what are the proportions of the market? Um, what, what makes the, the, what consumes the largest number of, of original works and what uses reproductions? Hmm. <laughs> oh, well, goodness, that's always fluctuating too. The, the publishing industry has taken quite a hit recently and the internet coming along and so much advertising going to the internet now that the hard copy publishers, say Sky and Tell and and astronomy and, and even the more commercial um, publishers that do books for the lay public, they are not producing as much because the money isn't what it once was. So at one point in time, at least for me personally and many of my space art colleagues, publishing was where a lot of the work was in the books and in the magazines. and. Um, and there is some market, say, with uh, commercial galleries. You might be aware of novaspace.com on the internet. They used to have a physical gallery there in Tucson, Arizona. Now they're all online. But really that has not taken off to the level that uh, publishing did there for a while. I, at one point, was involved in some product illustration. The Nature Company was around for many years, and I did some work for them. 
but it really does fluctuate, and today I'm not quite sure how to assess it because it is shifting a lot. Yeah, it, it really depends, I think, on the economy. It depends on what is popular in, in science, what the um, flavor of the day in astronomy is, and how, how excited the public is about it, because that tends to funnel money one direction or another. So I'm sorry that's not a very definite answer to your question, um, but I hope that does well enough for you for now. <laughs> a question for all three of you. I was wondering what the audience responses have been. Do you get fan mail? What, what kind of responses, like, does the public contact you guys to, to um, comment on your work? And what kind of reactions do you get for the visualizations that you make? You want to go, you you want to go first? If you have an answer. Uh, OK, well, uh, I'm not an artist. I'm a scientist. but. Um, I do get um, actually quite a bit of fun mail. <laughs> and uh, I have a Facebook page with uh, lots and lots of friends I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, these uh, you know, people write to me and they say, oh, I really like your work. And I get a lot of students uh, writing. Um, so uh, I, you know, and I don't know whether they know me mainly from the books or from you know, TV documentaries. I, they can part in, or how they know me, but people do uh, pop up, and um, uh, and you know it is um, it's significant enough that I have a mailbox that I call fun mail, <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually very nice uh, to um, uh, have people write and say I'm really excited about what you do, you know, and I really like what you do, but a lot of them I think have seen me on TV. Uh, rather than have read my books. Yeah, I've had you know, the recent installations I've done. I've had terrific response, and um, and really across all age groups, which is really, really cool. I mean, I actually like that a lot. One of the things I've I found early, it doesn't. It, it relates to all imagery, but. Um, some of my earlier works, I realized when I, when I published a lot of books, I don't publish books so much anymore because I'm working differently, but um, what I realized is there was like a cutoff in friends of mine's children where up until about 11 or 12 years old, the printed page, the picture, a photograph, was like a window and they went into that world and it was very gratifying because you could take them places. And then something happens, I guess it's you know related to puberty or something, and adults, you know, then it became ink on paper, and, and it, it was a representation, but it wasn't a window. It was a very interesting thing. Um, so the answer more specifically, I mean, I, yeah, I, I do get, but I, I think the best response for me, because I'm making these environments, and there's no, you know, there's videos on my website of walkthroughs of the environment, but there's nothing like being in the environment. Maybe that's why we're so interested in virtual reality. So to stand sometimes, you know, when I do those environments, I like to be anonymous in the space, and watch what happens and how people interact with, I mean, I'm doing interactive sculpture and video and, and sound and point sound, so it's focused in specific areas. And it's, yeah, it's really thrilling. I mean, it's not, you know, and it's, it's a, it's not an economic model, nothing's sold. I mean, people come into these spaces and walk away and, you know, I'm gonna be in the RV park soon, but that's okay. So. Um, yeah, that's, but that response actually of watching people experience a real physical work in a real physical space, that's really the, that's really the good one. So. I do sometimes get fan mail. I have a website and um, email address on the website, and I do sometimes get messages from people I never heard of from all over the world, and that's really pretty fun. And that's what I think is one of the greatest things about the internet, that it's so easy to be found now. Yeah. Having said that, I'm thinking as all of you are talking about a time that I got a snail mail letter that was forwarded by Astronomy Magazine and someone had written in talking about how much they appreciated my work in, in an issue. And it was several years ago, it was really before the internet took off. But I really treasured that. I mean, the fact that somebody took the time to put a pen to paper and a stamp on an envelope and send it in 
And I think that was marvelous. And personally, I'd like more of that. <laughs> so, so if you'd all like to send me some mail, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, uh, in f well, before the next question, I'll just make a comment that in fact, the internet has really changed, I think, the way that everybody works. And uh, uh, books, for example, uh, a lot of people used to buy books, uh, non-fiction books, because they actually wanted to know the material and they wanted that as a reference. And that has really changed. Uh, people don't buy so many books anymore and I have noticed it myself, uh, particularly when I'm doing my taxes. The amount of money that I spend on books actually for work has gone down and down and down. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, I still write books, but it's not really an economical thing. I just do it because I like it. And, uh, and I think, as Lynette was saying, for the artists, uh, you used to do the, more of the fine art, and now everything is digital. And uh, um, so th there's been a lot of change uh, for, you know, the artist and certainly the scientist uh, in the last uh, 10, 20 years. So? Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one of the things I just wanted to add, it's not exactly to the point of that question, but that we all face is we live in this image-saturated world. So if you want to think of it in terms of competition as an artist, if you're thinking about trying to reach a viewer, you know, the competition is really tough. I mean, what image, all of you, you know, what image would stop you in your tracks in your daily life? It's, it's really difficult. And I mean, I think it's, for me personally, it's one of the reasons I've moved to multimedia because I'm, you know, how do I get that audience? You know, how do you take somebody, even if somebody's looking at a picture in a room where the, their, you know, their phone's vibrating and there's stuff going on, the truck's going by outside, and, and there's all these other inputs, basically. So, you know, that's, it's off point, but it's a, it's, a, it's a hell of a challenge for an artist. You know, it's one thing to go through the process for yourself, and I think that's a lot of what an artist does. It's, a, in a, it's very inward and... and, and whatever, selfish, not in a bad way perhaps, but it's a very inward process. But then when you get to the point where you're sharing sort of the fruits, your discoveries, I mean, I think being a good artist is being an explorer, it's being an inventor, it's many things. When you get to the point of trying to share it, you know, how do you do that so you, you know, you nail somebody? How do you get somebody to look? I mean, there's so much that we look at now, a lot of the great 20th century art. I mean, I don't even get a, a synaptic response anymore. It just doesn't do it. And Anyway, so that's, that is enormously challenging. And, um, you know, and it's evolving really, really quickly how we respond to, to these various inputs. So, you know, that's actually, if anybody out there has a question or wants to just say something, I'm interested. Because I think, you know, that's the big challenge. Dr. Drake has a question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, a fast growing and very active area in architecture and uh, engineering is 3D printing. Uh, it's also being used in museums a lot. I'm just wondering if people are approaching you to do 3D printing and have you had any experience with it? Hmm. Well, not yet. I had someone say uh, about a piece I did recently, a commission, oh, I want to see if we can get one of those done. And then the answer was, oh, there's not a big enough budget. So that's as far as it went, but I'm still hopeful. <laughs> yeah, it's not 3D printing I have thought about, but I have thought about uh, the new types of books where you do them digital and then uh, uh, the reader can zoom in, for example, on a picture and uh, get detail on that picture or they can go to a graph and then make the graph move or, for example, a lava flow model and make the lava flow flow downhill uh, just with the fingers, very interactive. And I think that there's going to be a kind of revolution in books as well. We're already seeing it uh, as they move from the printed page and, and magazines to the internet, but uh, then I think they're going to become more interactive. And uh, uh, so you're going to need to be a, a real you know, computer uh, whiz, or you're going to work with a computer whiz uh, to actually uh, make your books. And, um, and, and it's been quite interesting to think about that, how that is uh, going to change. And uh, I remember a, a, a colleague of mine uh, telling me that she took a, a little kid, you know, niece or something to a library, 
and, uh, um, and they saw an encyclopedia and the little boy or little girl asked, uh, what's all, all, all those books that look the same? And she said, that's an encyclopedia. And, uh, and the child said, you mean someone printed out all that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, you, you see how uh, in the kids' minds the, 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 this whole world is changing, at least in terms of the books and uh, maybe in terms of the art as well. Um, Frank, to your point, the um, artists are definitely using the 3D printers and uh, two months ago I was at uh, School of Visual Arts in New York and they've put in... Um, five floors of science labs for their artists to use. It's specifically for the arts. One of those floors is 3D printers. One is all biologic stuff, so people, artists are using things in, you know, Petri dishes. Uh, and so they're, they're really one of the forerunners of adopting, really going for science and technology for artists. So the three, there's some really fantastic 3D printed sculptures that are around and, and all those tools are being adopted. Um, I don't know if you've answered this already, you've kind of touched upon it, but what do you guys think of in terms of the future of scientific visualization in terms of both technology, which you've touched upon, and um, the markets, like any new markets that you can think of? Well, the shift that I really see, as I touched on earlier, is so much going digitally. And I feel like there's been a real separation in science illustration in that the, you now have the group of creative people who are approaching this from more of a fine art standpoint. And they may collaborate with scientists, but it's still very much in the fine art realm. And then the science illustrator who does the press releases and tries to visualize things as they would appear if you were there in person, it's going more and more to high-end 3D work and especially 3D animation. And the, the results are amazing. I mean, the computer software now is really amazing in what it can do and what it can produce. I personally am a little concerned as a starting out as a traditional artist in that it makes it so technical and much more, how shall I say it? it it's not a matter of going into the art store and picking up a, a paintbrush and a piece of paper anymore. You need a huge monitor and you need a, a huge graphics tablet and you, you need the latest software to be cutting edge. And it really takes it away, I think, from anybody being able to access that in a professional manner. And, um, and I also personally think, although I have some colleagues who would love to debate this to the end of time, <laughs> that traditional artists are more likely to have a unique style that expresses their own vision. And if we're all using the same software, there is a sameness. I used to be able to pick up a space magazine and see someone else's work and know immediately who created it. I can no longer do that, mm -hmm. and that makes me sad. Um, so I don't know if that makes me old-fashioned or if it's just a matter of the pendulum swinging to one extreme before it comes back part way and stabilizes in the middle. I don't know. I see value in what is done traditionally. I see value in what is done on a computer. And I think somewhere the best place is where they both meet. And I think we're still trying to figure out where that is. Hello. <clears throat> we were a little late, so I apologize if you've already touched on this. Um, just, we're artists that are interested in the use of scientific data um, reinterpreted as art, whether it's video or audio. And I'm wondering <clears throat> if you all have encountered anything like that. Um, for example, we're trying to reinterpret uh, the frequency of cosmic microwave background radiation um, as a means of you know, discovering different things about it and spreading that information in different forms. Have you? experienced anything like that? Well, okay, so, so one question back, and that would be, 
you know, as an artist, do you, I mean, does the, does the data need to take on new meaning? I mean, can it just be an aesthetic thing that you develop? Sure. You know, I mean, that's just a question. But the other thing is what you're talking about. I mean, the Institute is actually very interested in figuring out ways of visualizing, like, the radio astronomy data that's coming in. Again, that could be, you know, it's highly aesthetic. It's this thing that, what is it? I mean, it, it turns viewers on. It's a way of sort of understanding the data. I mean, obviously, the data is being interpreted in the way it's being interpreted right now. But I think it's, I think it's a great territory. And, and um, I mean, data, big data is one of, you know, it's one of the, the, the things of our evolution as a species right now, of dealing with it and moving through it. And so it's a wide open territory. And um, yeah, I would encourage you to, I mean, on any level, you know, go like hell at it because I think it's a really good area. And I mean, I know the contemporary art field's really interested, you know, in ideas about, you know, like that. So, but I mean, I don't think you, you know, as an artist, you're not a scientist. You're not turning it into empirical evidence. You're, you're doing something else with it. Um, but great, I mean, I love to hear that's what you're doing. I'll make a comment from a, a, a scientist's point of view. Actually, science visualization is something that's becoming really, really important. We have a whole group at JPL where I work who do exactly that. And, uh, you know, you might remember uh, sort of back maybe 20 years ago uh, when you first seen those movies of the flyovers uh, of other planets, how wild we were by all that. But, you know, that, that, that's just... Uh, you know, absolutely run of the mill now, and they do things that are a lot better. You know, for example, uh, in just putting together multiple data sets uh, for these missions that um, uh, have so much data that it's just much more than uh, we ever thought it was possible 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, data from different instruments are making 3D uh, visualizations of the landscape. Uh, you know, all that area has really, uh, really evolved. Uh, when I started out as a student working in planetary geology, uh, we had images that were prints, and uh, we would use those prints and map them, and, uh, you know, and that's just inconceivable these days. Um, so the, the, there's just been so much of a revolution, but now I think that the scientific visualization is, is a really important field. Okay, so, sorry. For all three of you, or it's more of an artistic question, I'd like to know your opinions or comments based on what you do because you want to do, or what you do based on what someone suggested or commissioned you to do, and how, how much you go into something between those two. <laughs> what, what was the third one? <laughs> um, just what you do. How, how, what, how much of I do is what I want to do? How much is someone else's vision? And what was the other one? Was there another one? Um, just the amount of detail you put into it based on those two, or how far you want to go into it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, boy, how much is what I want to do? Um, well, that has fluctuated too, because a lot of my space art started as my own vision, something I was interested in. I've certainly done a lot of SETI-based imagery that really turned me on. There was a concept that was inspiring to me, and one of the pieces in the silent auction is exactly that, Cosmic Awakening, that has the hibiscus flower as a radio telescope dish. And I was in my kitchen once a few years ago. I had that blooming in my, uh, right there and then, and at that angle. And I looked and I thought, radio telescope. I know that's really weird, but I did. And I think about SETI a lot and what it will take for that signal to come in and be detectable. And one of the most important parts of this is that an alien civilization must have been able to exist with its environment, natural environment, long enough to establish radio technology. So that was something, a, a piece that I saw in my head and then wanted to get it out on paper. 
and some of the exoplanets too. I was really excited about depicting them. I was there doing it right at the beginning of those discoveries. And to be able to paint something that nobody else had painted was a complete turn on for me. I mean, I loved it. And to be able to talk with Jeff Marcy and, and Deborah Fisher and some of the other wonderful people. And Frank Drake has given me great input over the years on related imagery, and so a lot of the work was self-generated. This said, of course, it had to conform to certain standards. It had to, um, I mean, I wanted it to be realistic. I was not after a painterly thing that was going to be a, on a gallery wall in downtown San Francisco, but something that would really illuminate and express science. But there are the commissions too, and I have worked so much with, with publishers, with scientific researchers and institutions that need it to look realistic, and I, they are my client. I, I have to do what they think expresses that topic the best, and it means that we have to discuss the data and I can't just go off and put purple polka dots on a planet, even though I think it would be neat. Or I can't put, uh, let's see, I can't put an ocean on a gas giant. I mean, they're things you just don't do. <laughs> and on one level, it's a job, and one does what one needs to do if it's a job. And that's partly why I like to diversify. I like to do some work that is my own vision, and I like to do some that is for, for a need, for um, um, the Gemini Observatory, uh, Observatory, for example. I have an image coming out on press release for them in a couple of weeks, and that's exciting to me. And to do something that has not been depicted before is really great. But I do miss the fine art, and I'm getting back to that too. And in fine art, I can paint what I want, and no scientist and no art director tells me it isn't okay. <laughs> so, and, and the percentage of each of those in terms of how I spend my time just fluctuates week to week, month to month, year to year. Does that answer the question? Do you, I mean, I'm going to guess you're an artist if you're asking that question. Is that true? No? A little bit. A little bit. I mean, there's this thing in, in art that sort of, that relates, I mean, the, the short answer to that is that at this stage in the last 10 years, I only do what I want to do. And, and that's part of this thing that I've developed. I had to get in a position where I could do that. But I think there's something in the arts that I, I think we understand implicitly if you're more in the arts perhaps it's it's more clearly understood but intention in making a work is is a really big deal you know are you are you making that thing to because you want to sell it or are you making it because you want to express something are you making it because somebody commissioned you to do something and you know they want their child's face on it or something so in, intention is a big deal as an artist and i think you know Picking a, a, a line and a method is also a, it's it's also an enormous choice about how you work, and there are, in effect, compromises. You know, whether on one side it's income, on the other side it's sort of how well you sleep at night. You know, at the end of the game, you know, when we kick the bucket, are we going to be happy with what we did with our lives? So, anyway, that's a. It's actually a really good question, and I think it's, you know, it takes. Uh, to, to really do it, I mean, it takes it, it takes discipline and it, and um, and a kind of fortitude to 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 go down that line. It also sort of implies that you're not, I mean, you're not catering to the critics. You're not you're not taking that feedback where somebody says, yeah, you know, I'd kind of like the top of that work to be green instead of purple. It's like screw them, you know. You you make the goddamn thing and and here it is. I mean, that's part of being you know being an artist. Um, there's different ways to do it. You know, one of the things Lynette said that I, I, I sort of, it's not so much a disagreement, but I think in effect we've all always had uh, access to the same tools. When painting was done with oils and brushes, everybody in effect had the access. Sure, some people had more expensive pigments and better brushes. But one of the things that's really thrilling now 
is that there's all these mediums that we actually touch, real, call it traditional arts, and then all these digital arts. And the point is that there's a vast amount of tools out there and there's a vast amount of ways of, to be an artist. And really it comes down to the cre creativity of the artist. I mean, there's, you know, you can encounter an artwork that's done lo-fi, whether you want to call it sound or a visual art, or something that's done with very high production values. One isn't necessarily going to get you better than the other. And I think, you know, as an artist, and making it a, as an artist, it's about, you know, using the best tools that you, in effect, can afford to use, that you have access, and being really creative with that stuff. I mean, that's how you do it. It's not about spending the most money on the gear. I mean, we all know really cool things come out of cheap video cameras, you know, blown up big. It doesn't have to be a brand new red camera system, you know, mounted to a, to a vehicle. So I think it's actually, it's, it's just an, it's, it's an incredible time for science and it's an incredible time to be an artist. The possibilities are vast. And um, so, yeah, there you go. Well, since you asked all three of us, uh, I am, um, I'm not an artist, so no one ever commissions me to do anything. Uh, but um, uh, we scientists work in a different way. It's much more that we have to sell our ideas to the sponsor. Uh, in this case, the sponsor is NASA or NSF, uh, and they will actually give you grants so that you can carry out your work. And uh, sometimes I have felt quite envious of those guys uh, back in the old days who had rich sponsors, and they were just, you know, the, the, the grand scientists who just got money and uh, could uh, think about their, their own ideas and do anything they wanted. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that must be nice if you were one of those guys. Um, but um, I had to have a quiet laugh when Lynn was mentioning uh, the hibiscus, seeing the hibiscus out of your kitchen window and the, how that inspired you to do this painting about radio telescopes. And, um, I see hibiscus out of my kitchen window, and I must say, I have never thought they look like radio <laughs> telescopes. So here you see the, the difference in the minds between an artist and, and a scientist. I think that uh, we'll take one more quick question and wrap this up. Uh, I wonder if uh, Lynette would like to comment about a problem we dealt with together some years ago, and just how you deal with it. I asked her to make a painting of an M dwarf star with a planet, planet when the first M dwarf star planets were detected. And she was doing the painting, and in the, in, the, in the artwork, there is the M star itself. And the question was, what color should that be painted? And the problem is, M dwarf stars are pretty red. Uh, but in fact, <laughs> the color temperature of an M dwarf is about the same as that of a warm white fluorescent bulb. And when something is illuminated with a, red, uh, a warm white fluorescent blood bulb, it looks white to the eye. Even though if you take a photometer or a spectrometer, it's actually a very red color. And if you put it on paper with the colors that the photometer has, your eyes see it as red. The brain does not c connect. So there's a very strange and wonderful thing that goes on that the brain corrects for uh, what it perceives as faulty color in the scene that you're dealing with. And Lynette was presented with this. What do I do? Do I paint the red, the M dwarf, the color it really is or the color that the brain perceives? Go ahead, Lynette. Yes, I do remember that well. <laughs> and star color has come up in conversation frequently amongst my colleagues and also with uh, art directors and editors I've worked with. And that's one of the great things of working collaboratively, especially if someone else has final say on what I should do because then they can tell me what the best choice is. Um, so in some cases, in fact in most cases, I tend to paint what we think ought to be there. Um, I mean, I, in that case, I did end up with something very red, as I recall, though I think I desaturated it from where I started because we did determine, well, it, it really shouldn't be as red as I made it. 
And um, so, I, yeah, I remember adjusting quite a bit on that. And even to this day, I will have people look at some of my art and, and cite a specific piece and say, oh, well, that really should be whiter, or that's too yellow, or that's too orange, or whatever. Um, but in the end, I get final approval from someone, from the researcher or from the editor, and we go with that. Well, that uh, brings us to the end of the hour. I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and let's uh, give a hand of applause to our panelists. Thank you all again for coming. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks, Gabriel.